Hello, my name is Miles Oglethorpe. I'm Head of Industrial Heritage at Historic Environment Scotland, the equivalent of the National Park Service in North America, only we only do unnatural heritage, we don't do the natural stuff. I'm also President of TIKI, the International Committee on the Conservation of the Industrial Heritage, and I've been working in industrial heritage in some form for almost 40 years. I'm going to be talking today about the unique value of industrial heritage. What I'm going to do today is to reflect on what I believe is the unique value of industrial heritage. And a part of that involves reimagining our future in the light of what's happened in the last year or so. I'm going to talk about the world heritage context of industrial heritage because that's been a, a big area of progress. I want to talk about people's, the real history of the people and also tackling difficult histories because industrial heritage has a role to play that other parts of heritage can't. And also the possibilities of helping to tackle climate change. Industrial heritage is really well placed to do that. A little bit about tangible and intangible heritage. And finally, um, I think all of us share the cause of wanting to pollute our education um, at all levels with industrial heritage. But I just wanted to start by just saying why it's an honor for me to be speaking to you today, because I believe SIA demonstrates the unique value of industrial heritage in its own right. And I was very lucky to be able to attend the Chicago Congress and meet many of you. And that was a truly amazing event. I was also lucky to be able to go to, to Michigan and Houghton and MTU. And so it was an amazing time for me. I'm very grateful for that. And I think it's also worth uh, pointing out that the US has made a giant contribution to the world of industrial heritage generally. And I would cite, for example, the historic American engineering record, the work of Eric Deloney, the late Eric Deloney, and um, the NPS, National Park Service too. All these are institutions and achievements that I, as a young professional, learned about. And, and attempted to take as exemplars. So it's very, very important. And finally, it's definitely one of the most important facets is that the Tiki Secretariat is still based in the United States at MTU, and we're hugely indebted to the previous Tiki president, Professor Pat Martin, who guided us through three terms and who established the Secretariat at MTU. And thank you, Daniel, for continuing to look after us so well. So the first thing I wanted to say about where we are now is that the pandemic has just changed so much and generally speaking in an awful way. But one aspect of it has been the digital revolution. And it used to be that you, you, I had friends who would disappear for days on end into the a dark vortex of video games and general gaming type activities on their computers. These days you do it on Facebook because there's just an incredible wealth of industrial heritage that's appearing. And what it's showing is there's this um, amazing, amazing number of people with fantastic material that they're now being able to digitize and share. And this is something that is, is opening up a world on, on an exponential scale and it's absolutely fantastic. And there's some incredible people doing incredible work. I, I cite this uh, particular site by Maciej Mutwil, um, a Polish industrial heritage uh, person who makes the most fantastic films all over the world. So this has been an incredible time for us. And what it's also allowed us to do is hold events like this that we never really got around to doing before. So it's been, uh, it's a time where we actually have to try to embrace some of, uh, amidst all of the tragedy and, and suffering, we have to embrace what are phenomenal technological advances. So I wanted to then move on to talk about world heritage. And it's interesting to note that the industrial world heritage really started um, in 1978 when the Lischke salt mine was inscribed onto the world heritage list. And this was eight years before our flagship site in the UK, which is Ironbridge. And it's really interesting to reflect on that now because it has millions of underground visitors a year. It's the most overwhelming and brilliant experience. But for me, the surprising thing is it's predominantly religious and even features a salt sculpture of uh, the late Pope John Paul. And it has fantastic industrial heritage element to it, but it's interesting to note that 
less than half the people who visit the, the complex actually go and look at the proper industrial heritage. So even in a place like this, which is a flagship of industrial heritage, there are people that don't visit it, don't visit the really important bit, the bit the reason it's there. And so we've got work to do even in, in places like this. And since then, there's been some extraordinarily large scale iconic inscription such as Volklingen in 1994 and Zolverein in 2001, at the same year that Saltair, Dermot Valley and Nulanic textile centers in the UK were inscribed, which was a year after Blood Afon. Um, so that a big surge occurred, primarily because UNESCO and ICOMOS realized and did carry out a study that showed industrial heritage was not properly appreciated or properly represented. So there's been this big surge and that has continued in 2006, there was the mining Ch uh, Chilean mining town, mining copper at Sewell, high up in the Andes, a phenomenal place. And Puente Vizcaya near, near Bilbao in 2006, the first proper bridge to be inscribed in its own right on the World Heritage List. But I think one of the really major developments that demonstrated the unique complex layered value of industrial heritage was Nord Pas de Calais mining basins, a coal mining region in northern, in, in northern France, which is so ambitious and, in, and incorporates landscapes, spoil heaps, uh, pit heads, and also mine villages and all the culture that goes with it. So it's a massive intangible as well as tangible to this, and it's had a major effect on reviving a region. We had our own fourth bridge in 2015. And in that same year, there was a really complex inscription in Japan, which involved uh, clusters of sites in Honshu, but particularly in Kyushu. So this was really, really important, primarily because it changed a government's attitude to industrial heritage at the highest level, so much so uh, that the, the entire government, including the Prime Minister, Mr Abe, turned up for the launch of, of the nomination. So, and that has been a landmark in Asia in terms of promoting industrial heritage. So what I'm really saying is that industrial heritage has been mainstreamed. And it's become even more impressive uh, recently. In 2019, the last World Heritage Committee to be held in Baku in Azerbaijan, we saw the ancient ferrous metallurgy sites of Burkina Faso. So Africa got its first industrial world heritage site, huge, exciting. And in the same session, we had the Ombudsman coal mining heritage of Sumatra. So some of the big gaps in the industrial heritage world community are being filled geographically, which is really, really exciting. And amongst them was probably the world's most important mining region in Czech Republic and Germany, the Saxon part of Germany at Erzgebirge, from which so much of the world's mining technology emanated over many centuries. And there's lots more in the pipeline. We have hopefully Tisadal will join the, the, the um, Norwegian hydro schemes that were all inscribed also in 2015. And we heard in this series about the Welsh mining landscape, for example. So there's lots more happening. And this is fantastic at a high level, um, a large scale, global scale of industrial heritage. But I thought it's worth stressing that it's the small scale stuff, it's the texture that really, really matters. And that's what really makes a difference to so many people. And it goes without saying that the way in for most people into, into any heritage really, but industrial heritage in particular is railway heritage. If you show somebody a steam locomotive, in most countries, they're going to get excited, especially these days. So, and, and so in trying to make links across different countries and within countries, railway heritage is a fantastic means of doing that. But mining heritage is also, if you look at what's been going on in Asturias in Northern Spain, communities have been combining together and working with industrial heritage organizations to save their mining heritage and make the most of it as the actual mining activity wanes away. And this is especially the case in Upper Silesia, and, and this is the Katowice area, uh, where there's a, a major reduction, but extraordinary coal mine villages, fantastic architecture and engineering. So a lot of good work has been going on there in Poland once again. 
I, I just wanted to make a, a, a what might appear to be a really bizarre point, but even in countries like the United Arab Emirates, which is so mind blowing, they seem to be interested in their industrial heritage. And along the way from the, the, the Burj Khalifa, along the creek is this Scotch Derrick Crane built in the 1930s in Glasgow. And not only has it been beautifully preserved, but there is a wooden model of it along the quayside which forms part of a slightly weird sort of tableau celebrating the handling of cargo and shipbuilding. But I just thought this was amazing. And, and, it, and there really is an interest in this sort of texture, even in a modern country like the United Arab Emirates. As far as communities are concerned, I think you'd be hard to find a better example than canals for something that has bound communities together and linked them to their industrial heritage and been a major source of energy for regeneration and placemaking. And Mike's going to be talking about a canal, obviously, in, in a moment. Um, and I, in the case of the United Kingdom, it was probably, in fact, I would guess, far and away the largest volunteering movement the country's ever seen to save the canal system. And now uh, the Millennium Link, for example, the Falkirk Wheel, the Kelpies, and the Union of Fourth Clyde Canals in the centre of Scotland are a major focus of continuing regeneration. So it's a really important story. One of the things that is really complicated about industrial heritage is, is the fact that it, it, it also tackles some difficult histories. These are often uh, oriented around military or pollution that sort of thing, or, or, or terrible exploitation. One of the most interesting ones is nuclear heritage. And we had a tremendous patch of the SIA Chicago conference where we, we looked at nuclear heritage. And I found these, these amazing, this amazing model and kit in the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry, which was just, just magnificent. But nuclear industry is a really, really fascinating and hugely important subject, which requires much more in the way of systematic study. And it includes some extremely upset, ups, upsetting sites like the Red Tower of Death here in, in Yakimov, a site that's well associated with the discovery of radium and Marie Curie, but also the, it produced a, the, a lot of the uranium for the Soviet, first Soviet atomic bomb. So it's, it's so significant on lots of levels, and this is part of the Erzgebirge World Heritage Site. So very, very troubling and difficult, but these things have to be addressed. And, and even, even what looks like relatively uncomplicated subjects like mining, well, for example, in, in the UK, we had conscripted labor. We, we forced uh, young teenagers, teenagers, teenage boys to work in our coal mines during the war. And some, a subject like conscripted labor is, is a controversial one on the international stage. So many of us have these often quite difficult histories we have to face up to. And I would say, if you don't face up to it, if you don't tackle it, then you open yourselves up to unlimited liability. You can't defend yourselves. It's much better to explore these histories and you'll find they're not all bad. There's some really, really interesting aspects to them. Climate change. This is a big thing. And for us in Scotland and the UK, we have COP26 happening in Glasgow this November. And it's really, really important to understand the role that industrial heritage can play in, in ensuring that we tackle and address climate change issues, that we recycle buildings, that we recycle the carbon that's already been invested in them and stop large complexes being completely flattened and new carbon being expended in, in horrible new characterless, placeless uh, developments. So, and Dundee is a really good example of a city that has survived and thrived because we managed to preserve, thanks to people like Mark Watson, we managed to preserve a lot of the, uh, the heritage, protect it, and then it, uh, to convert it to find a new use for it. It's really, really important. There's great examples of this across the world. I particularly like these examples in Taipei and Taichung, which we were lucky to see a couple of years back. And in Historic Environment Scotland, we've taken the view that we need to activate, we need to use heritage much more proactively in the battle to combat climate change. As this strap line says, we must turn our cultural heritage from victim of climate change into a catalyst to help us deal with climate change. So, and that's a, that's a message that we hope to be able to take to COP26. 
Um, and this is all about a circular economy. It's about recycling, recycling buildings, it's about regenerating often depressed communities and giving them a new sense of purpose and giving them their history back, which is great. And it doesn't have to be at, a, at an enormous level. Uh, as you know, we have these wonderful telephone boxes, which despite people photographing them with their mobile phones are actually being rendered obsolete by the very same mobile phones. But it's wonderful to see someone has converted one of them to a, a couch in a vodka bar in, in Aberdeen, uh, which I thought was really nice. I particularly like this telephone box, which has been converted into a defibrillator unit on the Slate Island of Eastdale in, in Western Argyle. Many of you will be involved in trying to pass on your unique knowledge to younger generations so it's not lost through time. And it's really important that we do this. And this, this particular process is a really, really important demonstration of the very close relationship between tangible and intangible industrial heritage. The tangible doesn't mean much if you don't know how to work it or maintain it. And the intangible doesn't mean much unless you've got the tangible to put it in some form of context. The skills and understanding of these technologies and their social context as well are so important. So uh, that's a really important role that organisations like the SAA has going forward. And equally, the education asset that industrial heritage is, is hugely important, particularly in the context of science, technology, engineering and maths. And we've been able to utilise a lot of the new digital technologies to, to embroil children and to sully their lives with, with industry. And it's been a, a huge exciting. So we produced a lot of education resources based around the Fort Bridge, which are now available in every school. I often say this to people, but I think industrial heritage is a really good means of fighting uncritical mass consumption without sounding like an old fogey. It is the case that so many young people, but young people especially, are not encouraged to think critically about what they're consuming and respect the material world around them and understand where a lot of it comes from. So I think it's really, really important that we use industrial heritage constructively to teach new generations about what it is or how it is they've come to where they've got and why it is they're able to live the way they do. And finally, just a, a word, just to finish with Poland again. I was very lucky to, to get involved with a shipyard project based in, in Gdansk. And if anybody needed any evidence of why or how industrial heritage can be so important, nowhere else in the world can claim to have had quite the influence that Gdansk and the shipyards did through the Solidarity Movement, which, of course, was a catalyst that, in effect, brought down the Soviet bloc. In, in the late in the 80s and, and in 1990 and the solidarity movement so it's absolutely brilliant that that this is now on the world heritage tentative list for poland um, and there's an amazing adaptive uh, incredibly ambitious adaptive reuse and regeneration project that's going with it so just a wonderful example of what industrial heritage can do for town and that town or city is gdansk or danzig in the old days it's a panseatic port and yet look at what the town chose to produce as Christmas decorations a year or so ago. They produced shipyard cranes. So that tells you how important their industrial heritage is to them. So to summarize, industrial heritage has its roots in communities across the world. It's great because it's not exclusive. It's not excluding, it's not elitist. It can be a force for sustainable development and regeneration and fantastic returns for adaptive reuse and second life for so much of its fabric. There are some difficult histories, but they don't need to be so difficult. In fact, we could harness them for the general good. Um, it's a fantastic education resource. People will have more time in the future, probably, to, contrib to contribute through volunteering. So industrial heritage is really well suited to that. So, so most of you, I'm sure, will be doing that in some form. It's a bridge between generations, which is perhaps totally valuable. And as I said, it's a really good way of linking the tangible with the intangible. That's me. Thank you very much indeed.